So thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be speaking in this uh, important seminar and uh, being made the fourth, I couldn't resist uh, a little recall of the, uh, of the Star Wars. Uh, we all need force at the moment anyway, so <laughs> I might as well say it. So uh, let's start. Uh, so we will speak about, I will speak about fractional, fully nonlinear degenerate elliptic operators. And uh, let me say that uh, I have been working with degenerate elliptic operator all my life. And what really interests me in a certain sense is to understand how the fact of losing uniform elasticity changes some properties. So what is still true and what is not true anymore. And um, so I'll uh, uh, say this in general. So what do we mean by a, a degenerate elliptic operator? We mean an operator that is monotone with respect to the Hessian. Here I'm speaking about local operators. So if you have two matrices that are ordered, say X less than Y, the operator will, ask, will uh, act on these matrices in a monotone way. F of X will be smaller than F of Y. Here, X and Y will be, of course, the Hessian of your uh, function. So one example is the linear um, operator where you tra trace A of X of D to U and A is just a positive definite matrix. Other possibilities when the degeneracy depends on the gradient. So for example, you take a uniformly elliptic operator F of D to U, but you multiply it by grad U to the power alpha. And in that case, of course, if alpha is positive, where the gradient is zero, then you will have degeneracy. Instead, if alpha is negative, where gradient is zero, you have a lack of boundedness. So uh, one other family of degenerate elliptic operator, of course, is the Pilaplacian, and there are many more. But uh, let me concentrate on some that are somehow extremal in this sense, and those that uh, we've been calling truncated Laplacian. As you know, the Laplacian can be defined as the sum of the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. So if you order this eigenvalue of the Hessian, then instead of taking all of them, you can choose to take just some of those operators. And so one possibility is to choose, for example, the case more smallest operator, uh, sorry, the k smallest eigenvalue or the k largest eigenvalues. These operators are interested for many reasons, but also because they come out in many contexts. In particular, let me say in differential geometry, they are the work of Shavu and Ambrosio and Sonner. In convex analysis, uh, there is a nice work of Obermann and Obermann and Silvestre. But more recently, really starting from the paper of Harvey and Lawson, uh, PD community has been working on it, so let me mention the work of uh, Caffarelli, Lee, and Nirenberg, Caputo Dolcetta, Leoni Vitolo, Sirent and Payne, Blanc and Rossi, um, and myself with Galize Ishi, and also recently Ferrari and Vitolo. Uh, uh, so what we have in mind is to look at the extremal operator, because for, for look fully nonlinear operator, every operator is going to act very differently. So one way to have information about uh, this fully nonlinear operator is to look at the extremal among those, which is a little bit what did uh, Caffarelli and Cabré in their famous work. Uh, because fundamentally, the idea is that if you look at extremal operator, then sub and super solution of this extremal operator are sub or super solution of the operator for which you have actually done the extremization. And uh, in that sense, the PK plus and PK minus are interesting in the among, among the fully nonlinear degenerate operators. Uh, a little disclaimer, I'm not an expert in non-local operators. This is a really a first attempt to understand how things go in this setting of degenerate and non-local operators. So please, anyone who has a feedback is uh, very welcome to give it to me, to us in general. Uh, how does one define fully uh, nonlinear, uniformly elliptic operator in the fully nonlinear case? Well, that's the idea is that when you look at the difference between f of u plus v and f of u, you maximize it or you minimize it with uh, the Pucci operator, which are defined in this way. M plus is the soup of the trace of a d to u 
and here it should be m minus is the inf of the trace of a d to e. So this is how the condition that defines the fully nonlinear operator, uh, which are uniformly elliptic. Okay, but uh, let me go uh, on the non-local context. And uh, uh, in the non-local context, Caffarelli and Silvestre gave this sort of analogous uh, definition of uniform ellipticity. Uh, or at least of ellipticity, like you consider a class of operator with kernel that has this property, then your operator is the principal value of this integral over Rn multiplied this difference multiplied by the kernel. And then your operator f in, gener in general is going to be uniformly elliptic if you can bound it above and below again by the supremum of the operator that have been defined in this way and the infimum, as long as you choose your class of um, nucleus of, of kernel um, bounded above and below, for example, in some subclass, but the class that really interests us is the one that is bounded above and below by the, uh, by the kernel that would be the kernel of the, of, of the Laplacian, okay? Sorry, this has increased. Uh, can you see the whole? Yes. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, the a possible definition. Uh, okay. Now we want to. This is fully non. Uh, it would be the the um, uniformly elliptic. Now we would like to go in the realm of the generate non-local operator. And so this is a joint work with Giulio Galize of Sapienza and Erwin Top uh, from Chile. And uh, we have looked at a class of non-local degenerate operators that are somehow extremal. So let me go back to, uh, I'm going to do a, um, a comparison between these operators. So I recall you that I, we call the PK plus this truncated Laplacian, which was just the sum of the K largest eigenvalue of the Hessian. One way of defining this sum is just by taking K uh, unit vector, which are orthonormal. You take the, the, the the form T to U Xi Xi and sum among all the this direction Xi. You can do this for any fixed set of K dimensional uh, vector of K uh, vector uh, um, that are orthonormal. And you maximize this will give you exactly the same result with the advantage that you don't really immediately uh, play with the eigenvalue but with this definition. So it is quite natural to consider instead, you say, okay, I want to consider a maximizing operator. So on what do I want to maximize? I want to maximize among the sum of these non-local operator, which are written here, okay? So I X C I U of X is just the, the, uh, pseudo differential operator in the direction C, uh, um, whose symbol is CV, or if you want, it is a sort of a non local second derivative in the direction C. So fix K direction C, you take this C uh, derivative, second derivative in that direction, non local, of course. And then you maximize among all these possible sums. Okay, so this you see the analogy with the fractional truncated Laplacian. And of course, in the similar way, you can define the minimum and then you would get the IK minus. Okay, we will see that this is not the only possible uh, um, way of defining uh, this sort of non local operator. But so let me remind here that IXU, the way it's defined, the converges to the second derivative in the C direction, as long as you choose correctly the constant C that depends here. And IK plus converges to PK plus, so while IK minus will converge to PK minus. 
Okay, recently there is a work of uh, Del Pezzo, Del Pezzo Quas and Rossi in the case K equal to one concerning the P1 plus uh, operator to study the fractional convexity, because of course, if you look at only the, the principal uh, one uh, sign of one eigenvalue of the Laplace of the Hessian, you find the notion of convexity. Okay, so now, um, let me begin by saying the, the first things that come to mind. So does the strong maximum principle hold? You know, you, this is at the least one can hope. Well, uh, you see, the point is that uh, if indeed you have a super solution, so here I'm taking I n minus, I n minus meaning, meaning that I take the minimum in the above um, definition. So just to remind you, if I manage, here this was the maximum. Suppose you take the minimum instead here. So this will correspond to PK minus, okay? So this is the small sum of the smallest eigenvalue. So you are, this is a, an interesting result, look. We are taking n, n is the dimension of the space. So we're considering all possible direction, okay? So this looks sort of, uh, of elliptic, it is not really uniformly elliptic because there's no direction of degeneracy in a certain sense. And indeed, if you take uh, a function which is a super solution and attain its minimum at x naught, then u is constant. So the strong maximum principle for i n minus holds. Instead, instead, if you take not all the possible n direction, but you fix a k number of vector which is strictly less than n, then there exists non-constant smooth solution which attend their minimum at some point in Rn. So the strong maximum principle does not hold. And this is very simple, uh, yes, because just take a function of one variable which is, uh, which attain its minimum at, uh, at one point, well, then uh, it's easy to see at this point that if you take general k direction, which don't include the direction e n of x n, this function phi is u is constant, so these values are all zero. So this quantity is zero, but i k minus is certainly smaller than this one, and so this indeed is a super solution, and then you have a contradiction. So it's a very simple way of seeing that the strong maximum principle doesn't hold for i k minus. But uh, fortunately, instead, the proof of i n minus uh, is uh, sort of standard, uses the propagation of maxima, for example, but it's, it's sort of simple. Uh, but what is interesting is that this result on the strong maximum principle for i n minus really uh, implies a, a strong maximum principle for any ik plus operator, okay? It's not surprising. I mean, ik plus is an operator for which if you ask something to be negative and you're taking the maximum, you're asking much more than if you ask something which is, which is a minimum to be negative. So this for ik plus, the strong minimum principle holds. Of course, you could exchange sinus and then you, you would have uh, the, the vice versa, okay? Okay, so we see immediately that things don't go exactly as one would expect, but uh, the good thing is that still something can be done and some form of strong maximum principle holds. But the first thing we, the other thing we wanted to know is how does this operator act on a radial function? Because uh, as you will know, if you need to, 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 to construct a solution in viscosity solution, you need to uh, somehow construct sub and super solution. And often sub and super solution are constructed through radial functions. So to know how the operator acts on radial function is very important. So we looked at what happened in the case of the local operator. For the local operator, it's well known that radial function have only two eigenvalues, the second derivative and the first derivative divided by the radius itself, which has instead n minus one multiplicity. 
So depending on which is the largest of these two eigenvalues, it's easy to compute pk minus or pk plus. You just need to look at how old these two things are. So for example, if g second is larger than g prime over r, then uh, all you will have k direction, if k is strictly less than n, k direction that are small are smaller than this one. And so you are sure that pk minus is just k times the smallest of the eigenvalues. Instead, um, pk plus is the second eigenvalue, which is the largest. And then I have to take k minus more, uh, k minus one more eigenvalues. And so I pick them among the smallest one. And so as you see, this is very similar to the Laplacian in dimension k for radial solution, in fact, it's equal, while this is somehow a first order operator. So it acts in a very strange way for to, in order, even though it, it's a second order because it acts on Hessian, but really it's somehow a first order operator. So already we see the difference, but this is the case of, uh, um, of local operator. What can we say for radial function for ik plus and ik minus? Okay, here the game is more complicated because you cannot compute the eigenvalue, just you need to compute that integral. So somehow you have to say something else. Okay, so here, uh, here is the game. So suppose that the function u uh, is radial, but instead of looking at the function of mod x, I'm going to look at the function of mod x squared. It's just another way of seeing it. Well, if this function g tilde is convex, then I, the supremum of the direction that will give you the highest value, so take only one direction, look at all the possible direction of derivative, the highest derivative will come with respect to the same direction of x. So you take the, here you have two possibilities, either you go in the direction of x or you go uh, orthogonal. Instead, the smallest uh, of this value of this uh, the re second derivative, if you want, is given by any direction that is orthogonal to x hat. Here, of course, you have n minus one of this direction. You choose any one of them, you, you get the same result. And so somehow we have seen that these two uh, direction, the one parallel to x and the one orthogonal to x, x give me the two extremals, okay? So, um, so this, uh, in a certain sense, uh, conveys the result that if this function g tilde is convex, well, not surprisingly, as we have seen here, that the smallest direction is, is x orthogonal, that it doesn't depend on which orthogonal vector you choose. So you just take k times this value. If g tilde second derivative is convex, then we can also treat the case k equal to n. You see, if k is equal to n, this is, is interesting. You cannot take n direction which are orthogonal because there are only n minus one direction orthogonal. So if k is equal to n, you are obliged to take also, if you choose the orthogonal direction, then in order to have an orthonormal base, you are obliged to take x hat, but this one is the largest. So what happened that this is not the best possible direction. In fact, the best possible direction is you put, if you put yourself in between the two. In, in dimension two, it would mean that you are pi over four to x, okay? So this is the, the, the you can find n vector orthonormal vectors that have this angle with x hat such that the square the, the the product is one of square root of n and so you just have to take these n directions okay as long as the second derivative is convex and um, and i k plus instead is defined in this way so uh, again this looks very much like what we expected okay let me um, say that this, this fact here, the, if you look at two and three, already uh, we can see something that i n minus and i n plus are not the same because this last 
uh, equality is true for k equal to n. And so you see that i n minus and i n plus are not the same. And this is, is very non-local phenomena because p n plus and p n minus are the same because they're equal to the Laplacian, okay? So here you are in a completely different uh, uh, way. So these two are not equal and they're not equal to the fractional Laplacian for the simple reason that you are not looking, let me go back one second to uh, the definition. We are not looking at uh, the whole, uh, the, an n-dimensional integral. This is a one-dimensional integral. We are integrating between minus infinity and plus infinity in the direction C. It, it, when you look at the fractional Laplacian instead, uh, you are looking at an integral that covers all of our n. So even if we are taking n direction, n direction is our n uh, uh, axis of your of a basis, but it doesn't cover the whole game. Okay, you cover it because you're taking the soup. So in order to look at the soup, you have to look at everywhere. But in each one of these direction, then you don't. You only look at n direction. So. In this sense, it's not surprising that uh, this is uh, uh, different from the Laplace. Okay, just a, a, a remark here. I'm looking at uh, uh, at the property of G tilde, but G tilde convex just means that the second derivative of G, so the, the standard ra radial function, is greater than G prime over R. So you, if you order your, your eigenvalue, it's normal that i k minus should be the small k times i x orthogonal. So the condition g tilde convex is intrinsic to this computation. On the other hand, the condition that the second derivative b convex is a little bit more annoying. It shouldn't be there, but we cannot prove it without this condition, so we have to keep it. But we, it could be that it's not really uh, useful. Okay. Okay. Um, I just wanted to show you this first uh, formula here, which is very simple. Or if you prefer this one, okay, the fact that the the smallest you obtain is, is x hat is a very very simple um, uh, proof. So I I would like to show you. Can you see the whole screen? Because I cannot see all of it. Can you see all of it? Yes. Okay, so you see here, if, if you look at the definition of this operator in the direction C, let me write it this way. The only part that depends on the direction is in the two first term. Here you have X hat over C and the plus, and the other is with minus. So the rest doesn't depend on C. Since you want to minimize with respect to C, what you really want to minimize is this sum of these two G tilde, okay? Which has exactly this form. It's something, a sum, the sum on operator computed on A plus B, if you want, and the other is J tilde computed A minus B. If G is convex, H is convex, H and h second are even, but this means that your function a is, is convex with a minimum in zero. And then this is very easy at this point because this tells you immediately that h of zero is less than h of one. And so that h of zero, which is just twice ga, is just the sum of these two. And this means that if we go back to our equation, that this quantity is smaller than this of this sum. Whatever is the quantity that I take here. But if you think about it, this is just this quantity when xi is orthogonal to x. So what we are saying is that uh, you just now subtract, integrate, and then you get that ix of zero is less than ixc of u. So this is exactly this inequality. And at this point, if you know it for one direction, see you, you can take K of them that are orthogonal, you just get this quantity that this is a K minus, which is indeed K times I of X zero. So you see, it's just this remark that these two in fact have a minimum in zero and huh? GA plus BT. Okay. I won't show you the second one, but it's not much more complicated once you know how to play with the convexity. Okay, but so now 
what are the functions for which we can indeed compute uh, these uh, ik plus and ik minus? Well, okay, these are some examples. For example, you can consider mod x to the power minus gamma, as long as gamma is between, my, between zero and one. Or you can consider larger class A, as long as you take A strictly positive, then you have power for any gamma positive. This also exponential or minus X to the gamma if gamma is between zero and two S. So these are just example. But what is interesting is that this example, in particular this one, will allow us to construct somehow what we could call a fundamental solution. That is a solution which is equal to zero everywhere, but in zero in a certain sense, okay? So, uh, so this is just, you just make a computation. This function now, we know that it has the right property. So we know how to compute explicitly just using the two direction that we have fixed. And doing this, we can see that we obtain something which is not surprising is uh, depends on minus gamma to the power x to the power of minus gamma plus two s, but is multiplied by the constants that depend on gamma, gamma is the power here. And we cannot compute explicitly, but it's easy to see that in fact, it is zero in zero, it is decreasing and it tends to plus infinity at one. So there is a gamma bar for which this is zero. And this gamma bar is exactly that gamma bar that is going to give me what I want to call a fundamental solution, a solution which is positive, which is singular in zero, but uh, is equal to zero everywhere, but in zero, okay? So these are not uh, uh, variational operators, so it's not really a fundamental solution, but somehow it has the property of the fundamental solution. Okay, and uh, uh, okay, so uh, what can we do with this? Well, uh, what we can do is that we can actually prove some, for example, Liouville theorem. This is one of the applications that we have. So let me recall by what I mean by Liouville theorem, since Liouville has many, many results at its name. <laughs> what I mean are the class standard Liouville theorem in the sense of uh, uh, non-existence of solutions, of entire solutions. So as you all know, uh, for the Laplacian, if you take a super harmonic function, which is bounded from below in dimension two, so only in dimension two, if you have a super solution, which is positive, then this super solution needs to be a constant, okay? In dimension higher than two, if you have just a super solution and your function u is bounded from below, there could very well be some non-constant super solution. One example is the one here. This is a very well-known example that we will see even later. In order to say that you don't have non-negative solution, you have to ask more. It's not enough to be a super solution. You have to be harmonic. So if you are a harmonic function about the from below, then u is constant. This is true in any dimension, okay? So this is just basic fact about Liouville um, for the Laplacian. Okay, so what happens if, we remove uniform ellipticity. So we looked at this problem with, um, uh, with um, Giulio Galise and uh, Fabiana Leoni. And uh, so uh, you see there, is, uh, there are some similarities and there are some differences. So one similarity is that if you take a super solution, which is non-negative, and you consider k equal to one and k equal to two. So recall that somehow this reminded us of the Laplacian in k dimension. And so not surprisingly, we know that we have an analogous result of what happens for the Laplacian. For k strictly greater than two, there exists non-constant super solution. And you see here again, this is similar to the Laplacian. And you can take the same function just you replace dimension with k, not surprisingly. More surprisingly instead is that this pk minus, k strictly less than n, uh, you can find uh, for any k uh, uh, super solution, no solution, sorry, that are non-negative. I mean, all 
super solutions that sub solutions that are not negative. Sorry, there are super solutions that are not constant. So this is different from the Laplacian case, you see, because here we needed you to be constant. Instead, here you can construct solution and it's not even very difficult. So you see that things go differently already with this PK minus. So we wondered if the non-locality changed something and indeed it does. It's not, we don't have the analogous result for IK plus and IK minus, which makes it more interesting in a certain sense. And uh, this we see is very simple because you just take a convex function uh, of one variable. And then when you compute PK minus, you have N minus one eigenvalue zero and the other is positive. So when you take the K minus one, they're all zero. And so this, this is just immediate. Okay. okay, so what happens for fully nonlinear, non-local uniformly elliptic operator? This, this has been treated by Felmer and Quass. And uh, they proved that if n plus, which is a number related to the fundamental solution of the operator is greater than 2s, 2s is the non-locality if you want of the operator, and u is a super solution, entire super solution, non-negative, non then u is constant. So there is, uh, an analogous, you see this condition and plus greater than 2s is exactly uh, the, the analogous in the non-local case. And you see a, a, a fundamental role is played by the function which somehow plays the role of the fundamental solution, okay? Because this n plus is exactly the number for which phi r satisfy n plus of phi r is equal to zero. This n plus is the one I have defined at the beginning of Silvestre and um, Caffarelli's Silvestre. Okay. Okay, so what, what could we prove here with uh, Giulio Galise and Erwin Top? Well, we proved the following that, uh, uh, okay, the, fun the equation, if you take look at the equation EKU equal to zero, so uh, we're looking at super solution. So think of here less or equal to zero. This has solution, has non-trivial solution, so non-constant solution, only if and only if K is greater or equal than two. Remember that two in the other case, uh, uh, is not the bound would be k strictly greater than two. Okay, so this is not the same bound than in the local case. And um, and here the 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 proof is done using exactly the um, the fundamental solution that we have defined before. You see, we had defined this gamma bar for which x to the power minus gamma bar actually was equal to zero. But of course, this is not an entire solution. X to the power minus gamma bar is not a solution in zero, of course. So you have to truncate it. So you take the minimum between one and X to the minus gamma, you take gamma bar as a power. And then of course, this is just a super solution of this, not anymore a solution, which is bounded from below because this is a positive function, okay? So here you can construct a, 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 a positive super solution. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is the case k larger than one. What happened when k is equal to one? Well, Suppose that there is a non-constant. So, so remember that statement is that for k equal to one, the only solution are those which are constant. Instead, suppose that there is one that is not constant. Uh, here, the idea of the proof, in order to prove this kind of result, one way is to construct sub-solution that go to minus infinity at infinity. And here again, we can use one of these functions for which we can actually compute explicitly the operator. And this is minus x to the power gamma, which had the required property as long as gamma was smaller than 2s minus one and positive. Then it's easy to see that this goes to minus infinity. This quantity is positive for x greater than one. 
And then the game is to consider this, this is a standard trick that was uh, um, actually uh, done by uh, Coutry and Leoni in 2000, I think. And this allows to prove that this uh, is a viscosity solution and uh, you get a, a contradiction because you should be uh, above this function, but the minimum of u is m of one, so it cannot be above everywhere the function phi x. So, but the, the key point is to manage to construct a solution that goes to minus infinity and infinity, which we could do thanks to our, our um, computation on how to compute this uh, operator on convex function. Okay. Uh, let me look at the time. Okay. So uh, then uh, another kind of Liouville type result are those that involve uh, nonlinear terms. So uh, look at the equation delta u plus u to the p in Rn. So I'm back to the case of the Laplacian. And as everyone in this audience certainly know, for n equal to two, there exists non-trivial super solution of this equation. For n for any p, instead for n greater than two, there exists a solution if and only if uh, uh, p is greater than n over n minus two. Okay, so and this is called serine exponent, and for super solution it is optimal. Okay. Um, Okay, so we looked at the same problem for EK plus and EK minus. And it's interesting because here things go completely differently from the local case. Okay, look at what happens here. Here we look at this equation. So we are looking at the entire solution of this problem, EK plus U plus U to the P. Well, this has non-trivial non super solution. I, I, I mean positive and yeah, non-negative. Non a super solution, if and only if P is larger than this number, one plus two S over gamma bar, okay? But be careful, gamma bar, when S tend to one minus, tends to zero. So this quantity here doesn't tend at all to uh, um, what one would expect, I mean, the local counterpart, okay? And uh, this was for ik plus. For ik minus instead, there are positive solution for any p greater than one. So you see here the, 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 the value that defines the limit between existence and non-existence is p equal to one, okay? So you, you go all the way to one. So this is completely different than the case of the Laplacian both for the non-locality and for the fact that it is uh, degenerate. Okay, uh, so you see in this case here, we don't have critical exponents. This uh, serine exponent doesn't appear, but this is uh, this second case here is very similar to the case of PK minus. Instead, this is completely different. IK plus is really a behavior that is completely different. But if you think about it, gamma bar, is between zero and one. Usually the, the power of, of a fundamental solution is much bigger than one. It's n minus two. I mean, you really are very far from one, okay? So it's, it's uh, interesting that we get a completely different value. And uh, okay, so this was what concerned EK minus and EK plus for K smaller than n. Remember that the case k equal to n was very particular for i n minus because you had this fact that you had to sum, you take just one direction, the direction, well, at least for x uh, radial, you, you just get n times this uh, direction as long as you fix a x c which has orthogonal, which has this angle with x hat. And so in this case, the, so the fundamental solution is completely different. We can still find the gamma tilde for which this function is uh, a fundamental solution for which i n plus of w is equal to zero. But this gamma tilde now, you will see 
is different because gamma tilde now tends to n minus two, which is exactly the power of what is the fundamental solution for the uniformly elliptic operator. So not surprisingly here for i n minus, the result is much similar to the case of the uniformly elliptic because there are super solution, positive, non-negative non super solution if and only if p is larger than this quantity this, the way it's written, it looks exactly like the case ik minus, but it's very different because gamma tilde doesn't tend to zero, it tends to n minus two. And when you go to n minus two and s to one, this converges exactly to the serine um, bound, okay? So in this case, we are much closer to what we expect to happen. Okay, okay, I think I have time. I still have some time, yeah. Um, okay, but as I was saying at the beginning, uh, this is one way of thinking of delocalize pk plus, but or pk minus. But let's go back to how this could be done instead. You see, look at here, this operator pk plus, remember, it was defined in this way, the sum of the two uxi, xi. So you can think of this of the Laplacian in a k-dimensional subspace. And then among these k dimensions then you maximize among all possible k-dimensional subspaces. So this is another way of understanding this definition of pk plus. And in that case, what you want to say is that you consider a k-dimensional subspace, you look at the uh, the, the minus uh, the S Laplacian, so the, the fraction, uh, fractional Laplacian in this V dimensional space, you see this is exactly minus minus delta S in the sub dimensional space V. And then what you want to do is that you will want to maximize, so this is one definition, and then you want to maximize among all possible v-dimensional, k-dimensional space v. And this maximum will give you jk plus, and this minimum will give you jk minus, okay? So this is completely different. Now the integral that appear here are k-dimensional integrals. Okay, so in a certain sense, you feel more the, uh, the k dimensionality of the pk of the jk. These are G, jk operator because we are in k dimensional setting, but each time you are looking at the non locality everywhere in this k dimensional set and not only among one dimensional one. Okay, so this is very different. And as before, if you choose the right constant CS here, the JK plus and minus will converge to PK plus and minus. But here now, in the case N equal K equals N, J plus or J minus is just the fractional Laplacian. It's actually, it's minus, minus fractional Laplacian with the S, okay? So, um, and of course, in the case, k equal to one, these two operators are exactly the same, okay? But let me tell you, this operator is less fun than the other one because it acts much more like a k, uh, as the Laplace, the k-dimensional Laplacian. And so the results are much more what one expects. So it's, in that sense, it's less fun to work with. Not that it is easier, but uh, you see the fundamental solution looks exactly as you expected, power x to the power chi k minus 2s. And, um, and uh, the, uh, the Liouville uh, result are of the same kind as long as you are above this uh, serine exponent, uh, there are solutions and above there are none. This is for JK plus, while for JK minus, you still have that above P equal to one, there are positive solution, uh, but this would be the equivalent result of not the Laplacian, but of the PK minus. So it's much more similar. 
So uh, the question of which is the right operator to define the non-local uh, is a question of taste and of problem and of question you want to solve. But uh, for the surprising part, I suggest that it's better to work with the IK plus and IK minus. And uh, I, I think I finished. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>